Hello, everyone. Welcome to a new lecture of our course on processing in memory. And actually, this lecture is going to be the last lecture of the spring 2022 semester. Uh, so today we are going to have to give you a few important uh, concluding remarks. We are going to summarize some of the uh, important topics on processing in memory that we have covered in this course. And we are going to discuss uh, what uh, things need to be done in order to enable the adoption of processing in memory. We have already talked about these uh, different points during this course, but it's good to uh, summarize uh, all these different barriers uh, for adoption of PIM and also the different solutions that uh, we and also uh, other research groups are exploring in order to solve these barriers and these challenges. For example, the functionality of and applications and software for processing in memory. We have um, cover different aspects of these during the course, and we are going to uh, talk again about these today. Uh, that is uh, another important topic or another important aspect is the ease of programming the interfaces and hardware and uh, compiler support for processing in memory and system support in general, in, in, in particular coherence and virtual memory, and also runtime and compilation systems that are able to schedule uh, work on the processing in memory side in an adaptive manner and also uh, taking into account the necessary data mapping and, and sharing and access control. And uh, also we will discuss and we will uh, present some infrastructures to evaluate the benefits of processing in memory, as well as the suitability or the uh, feasibility of different workloads for uh, processing in memory. All these barriers can be solved with a change of, of mindset, and this change of mindset should span almost the entire stack from the algorithm to the devices. We have to go step by step here. Um, all these um, challenges and barriers for, for adoption and the different uh, research directions that is important to explore to solve them are uh, covered or at least introduced in our book chapter, A Modern Primer on Processing in Memory that you can find in archive. And here, um, actually, in the um, uh, table of contents of the book chapter, uh, you can find section eight about enabling the adoption of processing in memory. Also covered in not so much detail, but uh, it's also there as well in the uh, shorter version of this work that we published at Micro in 2019, uh, Micro in 2019, and uh, also uh, the paper published in the uh, IBM Journal of Research and Development. So among all these different uh, topics that we need to cover and we need to study in order to be able to enable uh, processing in memory, um, it's um, really important to start working with uh, real team systems and uh, hardware prototypes. And uh, we have discussed and we have presented as several of these, actually those that are, let's say, the state of the art in real world processing in memory systems during this course, uh, including and with uh, an important uh, focus on the AppMem PIM architecture. Remember that the AppMem PIM architecture is a near bank processing in memory architecture where the memory chips are extended with uh, small processors that are called DRAM processing units or DPUs that we can find inside the memory chip near the memory banks. You can learn about this admin PIM architecture in several of our lectures, in particular in meetings or lectures two and three, um, we cover the architecture in a lot of detail. But it's not the only process, real world processing in memory architecture that we have discussed in this course. Remember that we also talk about uh, a couple of proposals from Samsung. The first of them was this function in memory DRAM or also called HVM PIM that uh, based on HVM2 memory technology uh, uh, customizes some of the uh, memory layers in order to integrate uh, processing elements that are CMD units called uh, PCU blocks. As you can see in this layout, each of these PCU blocks is connected to two memory banks. And this is more and then, uh, with a different representation how these PCU uh, these PCUs look like they are 16-16-bit uh, 16, 16 operand, um, so they uh, operate on 16-16-bit 16, 16 operands at the same time because they are uh, CIMD units, as you can see, these CIMD FPUs that are near the uh, input-output sense amplifiers of each memory bank. 
we covered uh, FIMDRAM or HVMPIM in uh, lecture four in this uh, spring semester 2022. In a later lecture, we also talk about a similar uh, proposal, but in this case, not from Samsung, but from SK Hynix is the accelerator in memory or AIM that is based on uh, GDDR6 um, uh, memory technology. And in this case, uh, one processing unit is placed near each uh, memory bank. And here you can see um, another view of this, um, of the layout of this AIM architecture where you can uh, identify the different banks, each of them with its own uh, processing unit. This processing unit containing an array of multipliers uh, multipliers and then another tree in order to perform reduction operations. Um, uh, especially interesting as well in this architecture is the existence of this um, global buffer that is used as a supplementary SRAM buffer that is used for data movement across different processing units and different memory banks. You can learn more about uh, the accelerator in memory architecture in lecture six of uh, this um, spring 2022 semester. The other proposal from Samsung that was presented in 2021 is uh, AXTEAM. This is a beam based uh, processing in memory solution that has been tested for uh, recommendation systems. And um, as we, you can see in the slide, they prototype this AXTEAM on a, um, um, uh, on a memory module uh, that has been um, extended with a um, reconfigurable fabric or a small FPEA where um, the authors uh, of the of the paper implemented um, different uh, processing near memory accelerators uh, to uh, compute um, uh, the, the operations necessary for the uh, recommendation system. So and here you can see the execution flow um, of these uh, operations in the AX team design. So if you uh, want to learn more about the AX team architecture, I can recommend you lecture nine in this course, where we also gave a short introduction to recommendation systems. And also for recommendation systems is this um, HVPNM that was announced this year in um, 2022. Uh, in the ISSCC conference by Alibaba. This is a 3D stack the logic die and DRAM that are uh, vertically bonded using hybrid bonding. And um, if we take a closer look at this uh, HPPNM, it has also been designed for recommendation systems and in particular to accelerate uh, the most important operations in the recommendation system that are memory bound, heavily memory bound, such as this coarse green matching that is executed on the uh, match engine that the, um, uh, this uh, HVPNM uh, contains in the logic die and the fine grain ranking that runs on the neural engine. So uh, this is lecture 10 where we presented the Alibaba uh, HVPNM architecture. And these are the processing near memory architectures, real world processing near memory architectures that we have covered uh, in this course. And you may remember that we talk as well about processing using memory architectures. And one of the things that we um, uh, said uh, in, in the corresponding lecture is that there are not so many real prototypes, real systems uh, supporting processing using memory. Actually, the first one that we are aware of is this paper from Michael 2019 called Compute DRAM, where um, using um, an infrastructure called SoftNC, that is a FPEA memory controller, they were able to uh, run uh, or to execute raw clone, raw copy and raw initialization operations, as well as bitwise operations in real DRAM chips. And the way that they did this was by emulating the um, operations, the primitives, proposed by the Rockland paper and by the Ambit paper to perform uh, internal data movement in memory subarrays, as well as um, bitwise operations. Um, they emulated these operations by playing with the timing parameters um, of the uh, DRAM chips, essentially uh, changing these uh, uh, times T1 and T2 that uh, between activation and pre-charge and between the, the pre-charge and the next activate, reducing them in a way that um, they violate the um, timing parameters that are uh, um, that are indicated that are imposed by the standard, but this way they were able to uh, very quickly emulate 
uh, the, the data movement from one row to another row, as well as the bitwise operations, as I said. And we took advantage of the findings of this compute DRAM work in our Pi DRAM uh, work that develops or proposes a, a flexible platform to explore end-to-end -end implementations of processing in memory techniques. Because in the end, uh, it's not only that you come up with a good idea to perform processing using memory computation, it's also that this way of computing is, is radically new, is completely different to the way that we are uh, still computing these days. So it's important to analyze all the different as aspects of the uh, system integration of these processing using memory techniques. And that's why um, the Pi DRAM uh, incorporates a hardware side and a software side. In the hardware side, we have an easy to extend memory controller and an ISA transparent processing using memory controller. And in the software side, we have an extensive software library and the custom uh, uh, supervisor software. You can uh, see a view of the, this uh, Pi DRAM group workflow with the, with the um, DRAM modules um, through the DDR3 interface. Uh, can access these DRAM modules, the Pi DRAM memory controller that can schedule commands to perform uh, operations such as row clone or uh, generation of uh, random numbers that we uh, studied in the corresponding paper. And as you see, the Pi DRAM memory controller is accessed by the CPU core in our study. It was um, RIS-5 uh, um, RIS uh, CPU where runs the user application that can call uh, the uh, Pumolib, that is the processing using memory operations library. Uh, here you can see a view of the prototype with the uh, Silinx FPGA where we um, uh, integrate the RISC-V system as well as the um, customized memory controller. To learn more about uh, Pi DRAM, I recommend you lecture 12 that was lecture 12 that was uh, delivered by Atabert Olgun, one of our PhD students um, and the lead author of uh, Pi DRAM. You can access uh, the paper from uh, the link in this slide as well as the source code of Pi DRAM from our repository. So real systems and prototypes are one of the aspects to continue developing and continue uh, exploring in order to enable the widespread ado adoption of processing in memory, but of course is not the only important aspect. Um, another important aspect are programming models and code generation for processing in memory. And we have um, as well talked about this uh, in this course. Remember that we covered uh, with a lot of detail the AppMem processing in memory system uh, where we find a host CPU processor that is uh, has access to the standard main memory and also has access to uh, PIM enabled memory. Remember, as I mentioned earlier, that the inside the PIM chips, inside the DRAM chips, uh, we have DRAM memory banks and also connected to them, we have uh, these small processors or uh, DPUs. So these system organization follows what is called the accelerator model. That is um, similar, resembles somehow the operation with um, discrete uh, GPUs and in, in, in general purpose GPU computing. And um, so, and, and here the admin deans are seen as a loosely coupled accelerator. So this requires that uh, the, uh, uh, the program runs, uh, so the program moves data from the main memory to the PIM enabled memory, then launches the operation on the PIM enabled memory on the DPUs in the case of the admin pin system, and then um, uh, uh, retrieves back the results from the uh, PIM enabled memory to the um, uh, standard main memory. Here you see another uh, flow, uh, flow diagram of how these operator, uh, accelerator model uh, operates. As you can see, uh, first of all, the processor loads the data to the uh, DRAM memory bank in the PIM enabled memory, then transmits the command to the DRAM processors, to the DPUs, and then uh, uh, the, the, the uh, computation starts, uh, data processing starts in the DRAM processors. And in the meantime, the CPU is uh, polling, is checking if the computation is complete on the memory side, and when it's complete, then the um, a memory bank uh, in the PIM enabled memory becomes accessible to the host CPU. Um, the one important characteristic of, as well of this admin pin system, but is also uh, kind of a common characteristic in other real world processing in memory systems is that there is no way or at least 
um, in other processing memories, it might um, processing memory systems, there might be some uh, way of communicating, but not um, in a very, uh, let's say, uh, complete manner, one-to-one -one manner. So um, there, there, there is a challenge here in the communication across different pin cores or across different DPUs in the case of the AppMem pin system. Um, the communication uh, across different DPUs in the admin pin system needs to happen uh, through the host uh, CPU. And even though this might entail an important overhead for certain applications, for many other applications, it's um, a small overhead that can be easily amortized. So these are all important aspects to take into account when programming processing in memory systems and in particular the AppMem pin system. We uh, delivered a lecture about programming pin architectures. With this was uh, lecture seven. But we also talk about programming uh, other processing in memory systems, for example, processing using memory. This is something that uh, we um, uh, discussed when we presented the SIMDRAM framework, is a framework for processing using memory uh, where uh, the user can generate uh, complex operations and can program the memory controller in order to enable these new operations that take advantage of processing using memory features. Uh, in the Cindiran work, uh, we define a programming interface and uh, ISA extensions uh, with uh, different instructions for initialization, for input, op for operations with one or two inputs, and for predication. Here in this slide, you can see an example uh, program using uh, Simdiram instructions. This would be like the uh, C code high, uh, written in, in high level language in a sequential manner. And this is how this uh, C code could translate to Simdiram. Uh, operation. So first of all, we need to uh, initialize the corresponding arrays in order to let the system know that these are going to be these arrays are going to be operated on the memory side using memory, and then we can start um, uh, issuing uh, different operations. In this particular example, addition, subtraction, greater than, and then an if else it's a predication operation um, uh, to implement these if else of the uh, this uh, C code here. Geraldo uh, Francisco de Oliveira, one of our PhD students, uh, delivered this lecture 13 about uh, Simbiram that is highly recommended um, if you are interested in processing in memory systems. Another important aspect of uh, processing in memory is the runtime, is uh, how do we uh, schedule a computation on the memory side, when should we uh, schedule computation on the memory side, as well as how do we have to map data um, uh, into the processing in memory, um, uh, capable uh, memory, um, in order to um, have the you know like more efficient uh, computation and more efficient processing in memory operations. And uh, one uh, key work in that sense is the PI, the, the simple PIM operations that are proposed as ISA extensions. Um, it's something that we covered in the in one of uh, the initial lectures. I think actually it was in lecture one. Uh, we presented this um, work that uh, is motivated by the fact that there is a lot of data movement in uh, many um, important applications. And here in the slide, you have the example of the uh, page rank algorithm in a conventional architecture. Uh, we have to move data back and forth um, between the main memory and the host processor, even if like uh, entire caches or entire cache lines of 64 bytes, even uh, though in uh, many, many cases in these kind of um, algorithms like page rank, graph analytics, we are only going to use a small part, a small fraction of these cache lines. So uh, the PIM enabled instructions work proposes uh, PIM instructions or PIM uh, enabled instructions that uh, run on the memory side. And this way, it's not necessary to bring back and forth uh, cache lines from the main memory to the uh, cache hierarchy in the host processor. Uh, it's much, much simpler by sending values from the host processor to the uh, main memory and then performing the operations in uh, main memory. In this case, as you see, a significant reduction of the uh, that total amount of data movement. He, this is an example 
example, uh, PEI microarchitecture, where uh, the, the, this work is, extends a conventional uh, system with a host processor and a, a deep cache hierarchy and, and the memory controller and access to, in this case, a three stack memory. This system is extended with the corresponding uh, PEI units. You can see these uh, PCU here that are the units that are going to execute the PIM enabled instructions on the memory side, but there is also a PIM directory and locality monitor in order to make sure that the scheduling decisions are correct. And these scheduling decisions will be made based on where the data resides. If one particular cache line on which we have to execute a PEI uh, instruction is right now residing in the uh, cache hierarchy of the CPU, um, the computation will be performed on the host side, but if this cache line is uh, in the memory and not in the uh, cache hierarchy, the operation is offloaded, the computation is scheduled uh, on, the, on these PCUs. And PEI proposed, I mean, provided uh, very interesting results in terms of um, 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 execution uh, time, as, as you see, uh, the interesting speed up here, uh, up to 50% in some of the case, actually is almost 50% is the geoming and also an important reduction of the energy consumption. This is a, a key work and one of the classic works in recent um, uh, research in, in processing in memory. And um, you can find, find a link uh, to the paper in this slide. But there have been also other works dealing with memory scheduling, I mean, with uh, um, uh, scheduling, how to schedule computation and when to schedule computation on the processing in memory side, as well as code mapping and data mapping, a couple of important works that we that have um, uh, covered these four uh, GPUs as well as uh, Tom paper from ISCA 2016 and also these uh, scheduling techniques for GPU architectures impact uh, 2016. Also related with the topic, uh, the work on gains memory controller as well as this uh, continuous uh, run ahead work. But there are still uh, several important research questions that are open and is important uh, to answer as soon as possible, uh, such as uh, these ones. What are the simple mechanisms to enable and disable uh, PIM, PIM execution? Uh, how can this uh, PIM execution be throttled uh, for highest performance, performance gains? Um, and what should be the um, data locations and the access patterns? How to uh, deal with access patterns in order to have more efficient uh, PIM execution? Uh, like uh, what parts of an application need to run or should run uh, on the memory side and what are the mechanisms to identify uh, those parts of the applications that are more suitable for processing in memory. A scheduling mechanisms um, when we have different processes on the host side that want to share the uh, PIM engines. This is an important topic that is uh, still yet to um, be explored, and um, as well as uh, simple mechanisms to manage the access to uh, memory, uh, such as uh, memory can efficiently, efficiently serve um, the request from the host CPU and from the processing in memory engines. And related to this access to uh, memory from the host CPU and the uh, processing in memory engines or processing in memory cores uh, is uh, of key importance how to deal with memory coherence. Um, as you know, uh, multiprocessors and multi-core systems um, um, implement different ways of uh, uh, supporting uh, memory coherence, uh, but these traditional approaches of uh, supporting memory coherence might not be suitable for processing in memory systems or systems with processing in memory capabilities. And this is actually uh, something that we can see in this uh, motivation um, slide where we see that traditional coherence like fine grain or coarse grain or non-coherence at all that has been have been traditionally implemented in uh, multi-core systems are far from the uh, ideal performance uh, of a PIM system, assuming an ideal PIM with no 
um, um, no uh, overhead from maintaining coherence. Um, a couple of uh, interesting works from our group have uh, provided solutions uh, to maintain coherence. The first one is lazy ping, and the second one that extends lazy ping is CONDA, uh, presented in ISCA 2019. Uh, CONDA proposes efficient cache coherent support for near data accelerators or for processing uh, in memory accelerators, and these um, near data accelerators that are going to be uh, computing on an application at the same time that the host CPU is doing something as well. Um, we need to, um, uh, you know, uh, we, we need a, a way of maintaining coherence uh, between uh, both sides, between the near data accelerator and the host side. And as we have just seen in the motivation slide, it's impractical to use traditional coherence protocols. One, uh, so there, there were three uh, key observations in this work. The first one is that these mechanisms eliminate a significant portion of the NDA's benefits, as we have seen um, in the previous plot. The majority of the off-chip coherence traffic generated by these mechanisms is um, completely unnecessary, and much of this off-chip traffic can be eliminated if the coherence mechanism has some insight into the uh, memory access. So in Conda, uh, we took an optimistic approach that can address the challenges of maintaining uh, coherence in uh, systems with processing in memory capabilities. First of all, again, insights before any coherence check happens. Second, perform only the necessary coherence requests. Um, so uh, in Conda, uh, we propose a mechanism that uses optimistic NDA execution to avoid unnecessary traffic. And what Conda essentially does is of loading a kernel to the memory side, to the near data accelerator, and just let the near data accelerator operate optimistically as if there were there, there was not going to be any problem, any coherence problem. So as you see at some point, there is a concurrent CPU and NDA execution with, where there is no coherence request because we are just going to assume that um, CPU and NDA are not going to access the same cache, learn, cache lines or are not going to modify the same cache lines at the same time. Um, and at the end, both sides um, uh, exchange signatures in order to check if there have been uh, any uh, actual uh, concurrent request to the same uh, cache line. And in that case, perform the coherence resolution that is going to be either committing uh, the results, assuming, I mean, uh, uh, confirming that everything went well, and just uh, committing the results, or in case that um, there was some uh, coherence conflict, uh, re-execute in order to solve it. Um, Conda uh, uh, produces results that are within 10.4 and 4.4% of the uh, performance and energy of an ideal NDA coherence mechanism. And this is the, um, the paper, and here you can find a link uh, to this paper. Very related with memory coherence is also uh, synchronization support. Uh, observe that in processing in memory systems, we have typically multiple cores or multiple processing in memory engines. And it's uh, also common that in these processing in memory cores, we have also several threads uh, running at the same time. So these threads, um, especially in some of the applications that at least in principle that are good targets for processing in memory, these threads require to synchronize. And there was no um, you know, like thorough study analysis and an interesting proposal to support synchronization in processing in memory systems until this um, Synchron presented at HPCA uh, 2021. Synchron proposes an efficient synchronization support for near data processing architectures. Um, synchronization, as I, uh, as I'm, uh, we are discussing, is uh, challenging um, in NDP systems. And one thing we show in this work is that prior schemes are not suitable or efficient for near data processing systems. So the our contribution is synchron, the first end-to-end -end synchronization solution for uh, NDP architectures. Uh, as uh, we can see, and uh, you can find uh, more details in the paper, uh, synchron comes within 9.5 and 6.2 percent performance and energy of an ideal zero overhead synchronization scheme. 
Synchronization is necessary in many important applications, for example, in graph analytics, if you have multiple threads uh, cooperating, multiple threads running concurrently, executing these uh, graph analytics applications, we will have, for example, to acquire and release to use logs um, in the end to access um, data structures that are shared by the different um, threads. And these that not, that does not only happen in uh, graph analytics, but also other important applications like bioinformatics, databases, uh, image processing, concurrent data structures, etc. We assume in this work a baseline PIM architecture that is uh, composed by multiple NDP uh, units or PIM units. And uh, inside each PIM unit, we have multiple, multiple PIM cores that have access to the same uh, memory space, typically uh, a DRAM bank or several DRAM banks. Um, each of these uh, NDP cores might be an accelerator or a programmable core similar to the uh, DPUs in the admin PIM architecture, and they may also have some private cache or scratch pad. Um, synchronization uh, challenges in NDP systems, first of all, is that these systems uh, don't have support uh, for cache coherence. Actually, in the uh, previous work is uh, coherence for processing in memory system, but Conda and Lazy team are focused on maintaining in coherence between the memory side, the PIM side, and the host side. But here in Synchron, when we say that there's no cache coherent support, what we mean is that there's no cache coherent support among the PIM cores or the PIM engines in the memory side. And uh, the communication uh, across uh, the different um, NDP units is very expensive, as uh, we have discussed as well. For example, for the admin system, this, uh, computer, uh, this communication is very expensive because it has to go uh, through the host CPU. Uh, as I said, for some important applications, the overhead is not that much. But for other applications that require more um, synchronization, uh, such as the ones targeted in this synchron work, um, this communication is much more frequent and, in the end, much more expensive. And uh, another challenge is that there is no uh, shared memory across the different uh, team cores. And of course, there is no uh, shared level of cache memory. So in the paper, we discuss the reasons why uh, other approaches to synchronization, such as those based in shared memory, because there's no shared memory, but even uh, those uh, software-based schemes for uh, message passing are not suitable for processing in memory. And that's why um, uh, we propose uh, Synchron with uh, specialized hardware support for message passing uh, approach in processing in memory systems. Um, uh, Synchron uh, provides hardware synchronization support. It extends the NDP units with uh, some synchronization engines that are going to um, take care of uh, handling synchronization primitives, like for, like for example, uh, locks, mutexes, uh, but also other synchronization primitives like barriers or handshakes as well. Um, without the need of uh, complex coherence cache protocols or atomic operations, and also uh, with low hardware cost. If we take a closer look at each of these synchronization engines, what we will find is a synchronization processing unit, as well as a synchronization table that contains important or necessary uh, metadata and indexing counters. So whenever a re uh, there is a, a, a uh, synchronization request, for example, a lock, a lock acquired from an NDP core, uh, this um, uh, uh, it is sent to the uh, synchronization engine that will place the corresponding entry in the synchronization table and uh, will handle uh, the synchronization in a uh, transparent manner. Um, this is going to be done with, uh, without costly memory accesses and with low latency. Synchron is also based on hierarchical communication in order to make the communication more efficient and less uh, overhead. Um, the, what this means is that uh, there is, uh, in, in, in each NDP or PIM system, there's going to be composed of multiple NDP units, as you see in the slide. There is one synchronization engine that takes the role of master and receives requests from the um, uh, global, from the local. Uh, synchronization engines and uh, centralizes everything and this way minimizes um, expensive traffic. So Synchron is the first end-to-end -end synchronization solution for NDP architectures. Uh, the benefits are high system performance, low hardware cost, programming ease, and general synchronization support. As I said before, um, all within 9.5 and 6.2 of the performance and energy of an ideal zero overhead synchronization mechanism. 
So this is Synchron, and here you can find a link to the paper. Also, uh, you can learn more about Synchron in the lecture that um, Christina Genola, um, who was the lead author of Synchron, delivered in the previous semester in this course, was uh, in particular in lecture 11. Related to synchronization as well, let me uh, recommend you another uh, interesting reading is how to design um, uh, efficient data structures for processing in memory. This um, uh, work on concurrent data structures for near memory processing. And together with uh, synchronization and with memory coherence, another important aspect of the uh, system support is uh, virtual memory support. Uh, there is not so much work on virtual memory for processing in memory systems, but um, there are a couple of words that I would like to uh, mention. And in particular, I, I would like to introduce this uh, work on accelerating pointer, pointer chasing in processing in memory systems. This work uh, presented the ICCD 2016 that is called uh, IMPICA. So let's start with a brief executive summary. Our goal uh, in this work is to accelerate pointer chasing inside memory. There are challenges, the parallelism challenge, and also the address translation challenge, as we will see. Uh, the solution is uh, in PICA, uh, meaning in memory pointer chasing accelerator that uh, proposes decoupling um, the uh, address calculation and the access to memory from the uh, PIM engines um, uh, by enabling uh, parallelism in the accelerator, in the PIM accelerator with low cost. Um, uh, the Impica solution also includes a page table. It's a low-cost page table in the logic layer because this work um, uh, Impica, um, um, say the test bed or implements uh, the solution of a, on a 3D stack memory similar to HVM or, or HMC with a logic layer where um, the PIM accelerator resides. And as uh, we will see, Impica provides um, performance improvement speed up between 20 and 90 percent uh, for pointer chasing applications and 16 percent for uh, databases and, and also an important reduction up to 41 percent in energy consumption. So let's uh, very quickly um, um, discuss what are the let's say, target uh, algorithms and applications of this uh, Impica work. In particular, uh, there are pointer chasing applications where linked data structures are used. And applications uh, like these are databases, uh, B-trees, uh, key value stores, or hash tables. The problem with these uh, applications is that um, they use linked data structures that are connected by pointers. And pointer chasing, especially when we have irregular accesses, such as in these uh, applications that we uh, have mentioned in the previous slide, is that um, we need to traverse uh, the, this uh, link data structures and, and we need to chase pointers. And if we are doing this from a CPU, for example, uh, we have to um, um, we have to go through this um, uh, the tree um, here. We need to find one particular node of the tree uh, A. This requires that the CPU accesses repeatedly and then it reaches to the um, desired node, right? And um, so, uh, first of all, it will have to access uh, H, that is the root of the tree, and then memory returns some data. Uh, in this data, in H, we have the pointer to the next uh, node of the tree, that is node E. So we have to access uh, node E and then wait for the data to come from the CPU and then finally uh, obtain the address of A and get the data from uh, A. So these are serialized and irregular uh, access patterns uh, that uh, can take uh, up to um, you know six times uh, the, the number of cycles per instruction in real workloads. So the goal here is to accelerate pointer chasing inside uh, memory. So instead of having to go back and forth from the CPU to the memory, what we do is replacing this memory in this uh, particular in Pika work with a, um, a three stack memory with a logic layer and inside the uh, logic layer, uh, we have the uh, in Pika accelerator. So uh, in this case, uh, the only thing that the CPU has to do is send in the request to the processing in memory side, find a uh, the accelerators there are going to find A and just retrieve the data uh, to the CPU. But there are challenges to implement this approach. And the first one is the parallelism challenge. If you have a single CPU, 
uh, you perform some computation, then some memory access, and then uh, some uh, more computation. If you have an in-memory accelerator, for example, for um, these uh, linked uh, data structures from the, for these uh, pointer chasing applications, uh, we can definitely reduce the total execution time because the latency of a single access, single memory access uh, from uh, the in-memory accelerator is shorter than the latency of access from the CPU core. However, CPUs, especially multi-core CPUs, exploit um, memory level parallelism. And what this means is that uh, several accesses to memory can be sustained at the same time. But uh, on, the, on the other hand, uh, these different memory requests need to be, um, uh, in principle at least, need to be um, uh, um, handled by the uh, memory in memory accelerator sequentially. So, um, as you see, uh, the, in, in the end, the performance is going to be slower for two operations in the in memory accelerator if the in memory accelerator also uh, doesn't take advantage of parallelism. So, these represent a challenge and an opportunity, and um, a single Simple accelerator is not a good solution. It's going to be slower than multiple CPU cores. But uh, one thing that we uh, can do uh, is to decouple the address calculation and the memory access uh, such that we have two engines on the memory side, two accelerators on the memory side. One is, um, uh, is uh, necessary to or is used to uh, compute addresses to access uh, from memory, and the other one is in charge of uh, handling these accesses, of accessing memory. If this access engine can sustain more than one access at the same time, it will be possible to uh, accelerate the application and reduce the total execution time compared to the uh, CPU baseline. So address access decoupling enables parallelism in both engines at low cost. And here you can see um, a view of the Impica core architecture with the address engine, the access engine, and then they are communicated by some access queue and response queue, and uh, they both have access to the uh, Impica cache. So uh, when the requests from, from the, come from the CPU, uh, they, first of all, the address engine uh, calculates the addresses, performs the necessary um, address translation and uh, sends the request to the access engine that accesses uh, uh, directly uh, from memory through the corresponding memory controller. And uh, at the same time, the address engine can be working on the next request from the CPU, this traversal too. So when the uh, memory returns the desired results that are obtained and are accessed by the uh, um, uh, access engine, uh, they are moved, uh, the, the results are moved uh, through the response engine uh, to the address engine and then from there uh, to the host CPU. But there is another important challenge here is the address translation challenge. Um, normally in, um, in, in conventional CPUs, we have um, a memory management unit with a TLB that uh, receives pointers in the, in the virtual uh, address um, space and performs the translation. To do the translation, um, it needs to do uh, page table walks. And these page table walks go through different page tables until they perform the uh, um, uh, address translation. And in the end, uh, one pointer in the physical address space is obtained. But the problem is that these um, page table walks are quite complex and involve um, multiple tables, easily uh, four different tables. And these uh, requires a lot of memory accesses uh, from memory. To, to memory. So um, in the end, it's a very costly operation. And it doesn't really make sense that we have the processing near memory accelerators or this uh, other, uh, address engine uh, requesting the address tr translation to the memory management unit on the host side. And because there is no um, memory management unit or TLD uh, on the memory side, um, uh, one potential solution could be to duplicate this memory management unit, but this is extremely costly and may create uh, compatibility uh, issues. Um, so uh, we uh, want to 
somehow reduce the overhead of this uh, virtual memory address translation and this uh, page table works uh, that we have um, the, um, seen uh, before. And the solution is the Impica page table. Uh, here are the ideas to decouple the page table of Impica completely from the page table of the uh, CPU. And if the CPU table has, uh, you know, like relates the virtual pages in the virtual address space and the physical pages in the physical address space, the Impica page table is going to be only a small region of this uh, virtual address space, but it has, um, in principle, can be um, um, connected to any uh, space in the uh, physical address space. So what we are going to do is to map the linked data structures into the Impica regions. And these Impica page table, as I said, is a partial to any uh, mapping. Um, uh, the Impica uh, page table, uh, first of all, and then involves uh, the, what is called a region table that defines the, the specific region of the virtual, virtual address space that is handled by the, uh, or it's going to be used by the Impica accelerators. Um, then uh, from there, uh, we can uh, access a flat page table that is of size two megabytes. It's not extremely large and is enough for uh, the um, specific uh, applications targeted by Impica. And then there is also a small page table with only four kilobytes that is uh, much faster. And with, by using this, um, it's possible to obtain the uh, physical address. Um, the tiny region uh, table is uh, almost always in the in the cache, in the Impica cache, because it's uh, very small and that's why uh, uh, the access is uh, very, very fast. And the, uh, flat, uh, the flat page table saves uh, one uh, memory access as well. So Impica was uh, evaluated using the Gen5 simulator. The code is open source. You can access it from a repository. And here you can see some results. This is for micro benchmarks, linked list, hash table, and uh, B3. Uh, we can find here up to 90% speed up uh, for database performance, as, you, as we have um, seen in the beginning up to 16% uh, uh, speed up and also an interesting reduction in the database latency up to 13%. And regarding the system uh, energy consumption, uh, we have already seen interesting uh, energy uh, reduction up to 41%, as you can see in the slide. The paper also provides an evaluation of the area and power overhead. And, and here you can find the uh, link to the paper. And this is kind of preliminary work, let's say in PICA is kind of preliminary work as a solution for the uh, virtual memory problem in processing in memory systems, but is not the only uh, potential solution and hopefully there will be uh, more works in this um, direction. Another work that is not the specifically targeted at processing in memory systems, but for sure can be adapted to processing in memory systems and extended for processing memory systems is the virtual block uh, interface that um, uh, we presented in ISCA 2020. The key idea uh, is in the, in the virtual block interface or VBI is to replace the traditional virtual address space that is something monolithic uh, using these page tables that are uh, managed by the uh, by the operating system um, and all these virtual address spaces are of the same size and and there is no possibility of different processes to access different virtual address spaces what uh, vbi proposes is a much more flexible approach with this vbi address space um, that uh, allows different processes to have uh, the tailored uh, virtual uh, address spaces, um, each of the size that is uh, really re required and, and also share access to the different virtual address spaces. And all of this is supported thanks to the memory translation layer that is proposed in uh, the VVI work and um, is integrated into the uh, memory controller. If you want to learn more about the virtual block interface, I can recommend you this lecture delivered by the lead author, uh, Nasser and Haji Nasser. Another very important aspect uh, of uh, processing in memory systems or uh, the processing in memory systems in the near future are the security considerations. Not only making the processing in memory systems uh, secure, but also exploring what are the possibilities that processing in memory systems provide in order to improve the security of our systems. And in that sense, uh, some interesting work from the Safari Research Group are the uh, DRAM latency, latency physically unclonable functions. The key idea here 
here is to um, take advantage of the random process variation that comes uh, naturally from uh, manufacturing and, um, and, and this way be able to uh, generate based on the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the probability of failure of the neuron cells, be able to provide repeatable and unique device signatures. Um, the key idea is to uh, reduce uh, TRCD um, in the access to uh, DRAM in a way that there will be some cells that have high chances uh, of uh, getting errors while others not so many chances and taking advantage of the errors that are uh, generated here in order to uh, uh, you know, create these uh, sequences of bits that can be used as uh, paths of physical uh, and carnival functions. This is uh, the paper that was presented in HPCA 2018. Similar uh, key idea for uh, D range that is a random number uh, generator. In this particular case, the work uh, D range doesn't uh, is, is not focused on uh, paths. It's focused on random values, but is based on the same uh, physical principles and uh, random process variation from manufacturing. This is the uh, D range work. There have been more recent work in uh, random number generation using DRAM. Uh, and it's um, more recent is this uh, quadruple activation or uh, quark TRNG, uh, where uh, the, the, the work is based on the new observation that is possible to activate four rows at the same time in real DRAM chips by violating timing parameters in a similar way as the compute DRAM. Uh, work does, uh, as, as we discussed in the beginning of this lecture, this um, for processing using memory, this is another way of exploiting uh, these uh, violated timing parameters uh, and, 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 and this way activating four rows um, at, at the same time uh, with two um, activation commands. Um, so the, the, the idea is to uh, load or pre-charge uh, some uh, different uh, logic values in different cells in different rows, in four rows in particular. We activate the four rows uh, at the same time, and this creates a voltage difference in the um, in the bit line. And this voltage bit, uh, this uh, voltage bit, uh, voltage difference, um, if it happens in a very uh, short amount of time, because the uh, the, the timing parameters are uh, violated, uh, will turn out uh, into uh, when enabling the sense amplifiers will turn out into a random perturbation that can go either up or down um, and um, in, in the end generating our random values. And these random values can be used, and these random values in the sense amplifiers can be used to, uh, can be used as a source of, of entry, entropy to obtain uh, random numbers. And, and here you, uh, you can see another view of the idea. First of all, initialize the uh, the contents of the rows, then activate the rows and, and, and violate the uh, timing parameters. And with these uh, two consecutive activates, uh, we have the four rows that are uh, activated. And when enabling the sense amplifiers, we obtain some random values in the uh, sense amplifier. So then uh, we have a, we need to read those random values from the sense amplifiers and uh, perform some post uh, process um, in order to obtain the actual uh, the uh, true random number. Uh, Quack TRNG is able to generate um, 256 bit random numbers for every 260 feet, 65 bit uh, uh, of uh, Shannon entropy block. And this is the uh, link to the paper. More important uh, aspects of processing in memory that is still we are already exploring, but they still need to be explored and improved benchmarking and simulation infrastructures. In this uh, course, we have talked about PIM benchmarks, that is, uh, org work um, and benchmarking the admin PIM architecture. Remember that PIM benchmarks is a collection of 16 benchmarks from uh, many different domains. They are uh, open source, and if you want to uh, learn about these uh, print benchmarks, there are also a very good uh, programming examples for the uh, uh, admin PIM architecture. I can recommend you the lecture eight uh, of this course. Another lecture that we have uh, in this course was about the move, a methodology uh, to evaluate data movement bottlenecks and also identify PIM suitable workloads. Remember that um, the move is a methodology with three steps uh, where we perform some 
profiling, locality-based clustering, and then we uh, classify the different memory bottlenecks based on the metrics that we uh, obtain from the DAMOV tool or DAMOV um, simulator that is uh, publicly available as well and very good um, uh, source, I mean, very good uh, tool for uh, processing in further processing in memory studies. Uh, so here in this slide, you can find a link to the paper and also uh, a link to the repository. And as I said, this was also a lecture we had in this course, lecture five, that was delivered by uh, Geraldo, who is the lead author of uh, the move. The move comes with uh, its own simulator. It's actually um, a new version of another simulator that we used uh, in uh, a previous work in the Ramulator PIM. I'm also going to um, uh, uh, talk uh, soon about another work that uses uh, this kind of simulator, this uh, Ramulator PIM, uh, but is not the only um, um, infrastructure, simulation infrastructure that can be used for processing in memory. Uh, here, in that sense, I can. I recommend you as well for processing uh, in storage uh, the uh, NQ sim simulator also for more work. Um, but simulators are good, they are necessary, but sometimes, depending on what's a, uh, a particular study, especially if we want to do some uh, quick prototyping and then quick uh, design um, space exploration, um, simulators might be too heavy, too cumbersome, and, and in the end, uh, inefficient. They may require too many hours of uh, running in order to produce the desired results. So that's why um, um, uh, Gagandit uh, Singh, uh, one postdoc in our group, led this um, NAPL, Near Memory Computing Application Performance Prediction via Ensemble Learning. The key idea in uh, NAPL is to provide a machine learning based model uh, for performance prediction in processing in memory systems in this paper called near memory computing. Let's uh, use NMC or near memory computing as a synonym of processing in memory. The executive summary very briefly is uh, this uh, processing in memory or near memory computing is uh, very promising to alleviate the data movement bottleneck as you know, but as I said before, simulation times are usually extremely slow. So the uh, goal here is to provide a uh, um, high performance and uh, energy estimation framework, high level performance and energy estimation framework for NMC architectures. And this is uh, NAPL that provides fast and accurate performance and energy prediction uh, for previously unseen applications using ensemble learning. Um, it uses uh, certain statistical techniques in order to make uh, the um, um, predictions uh, in a more efficient manner. And in the paper, we show that on average, it can be more than 200 times faster than a, a near memory computing simulator. The near memory computing simulator that we use in this study was uh, Ramulator PIM, as uh, that I mentioned um, a few slides ago. So um, these uh, near memory computing simulators are important for design, uh, space exploration, for workload suitability analysis, and there are uh, a few of them, but they are extremely slow, even uh, 10,000 times slower than uh, execution on a real system. So the key idea is to leverage machine learning with the statistical uh, techniques for quick uh, near memory computing performance and energy prediction. So NAPL, um, it's a model that has, is a, because it's a machine learning base, first need to train the model and then uh, make use of the model. So in the training phase of the model, first of all, we have an LLVM analysis. This LLVM uh, kernel analyzer obtains um, important metrics from the uh, application itself, from the code itself, and then also um, need to, uh, we need to have some microarchitecture simulation. We need to have some, uh, you know, like basic metrics from the uh, microarchitecture sites, from the architecture itself. Uh, here we run very few simulations in order to collect the necessary metrics, and then uh, we use all of them to create the um, to train the ensemble learning algorithm and create the model. The um, um, characteristics, the features that are used by um, this ensemble learning algorithm span application features that are obtained from the LBM kernel um, uh, analyzer and uh, architecture features that are obtained uh, from uh, the microarchitecture and from uh, some uh, simulations. After training the model, we can use it to uh, predict and because the model is already predicted, we uh, so already generated, we just need to extract 
the specific characteristics uh, from the application from the LDM kernel analyzer and use them, feed them into the prediction model in order to obtain the performance and energy predictions. We evaluated um, uh, comparing to a host uh, CPU, an IBM Power9 CPU, uh, comparing as well to a a, a, a simulator, ramulator ping, as I mentioned before, and using um, different workloads from well-known uh, benchmark suites such as Polybench and Rodinia. And here you can see uh, what was the uh, NAPL accuracy in terms of uh, performance and energy uh, estimates. We compared NAPL to an artificial neural network and also a decision tree. And as you can see, it's uh, much more accurate uh, than the uh, other tools. So it's uh, uh, pretty, uh, you know, uh, the uh, mean relative error is only of uh, 8.5 and 11.6 uh, for performance and energy. And also, it's much faster than an NMC simulator, up to, well, 1,039 times uh, faster than an, M an NMC um, simulator. And also, it uh, we perform uh, an, an, a suitability analysis as a use case in this paper, uh, where we observed that the, uh, you know, NAPL was uh, able to predict um, you know, pin suitability in a very um, efficient way and very accurately, as uh, you can see in this plot. Uh, this is uh, the link to the paper, and from here you can also access the uh, source code of the uh, simulator that we use, uh, Ramulator Pin. Uh, important studies that uh, we uh, are also uh, carry out uh, are about applications and how specific applications or application domains, uh, how can they benefit from processing in memory systems. Uh, one um, important um, you know, application domain for processing in memory systems is uh, bioinformatics and genome analysis, and, uh, and, 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 and here one of the steps in the uh, genome analysis pipeline is um, um, uh, seeding and filtering that are, tar uh, that are um, uh, you know, like uh, uh, targeted by this uh, green filter work. Uh, that uh, proposes fast seed location filtering in DNA uh, read mapping using uh, processing in memory technologies. Um, the genome read mapping is an extremely uh, important problem and is one of the, uh, is, uh, the first step in many uh, types of genome analysis that um, it, it affects uh, many uh, domains of real life, healthcare, medicine, quality of life. And uh, in the end, read mapping is an approximate stream matching problem, uh, as you may know. But the alignment is uh, extremely expensive. So what we uh, propose in Green Filter is um, a way of accelerating read mapping by reducing the number of uh, required alignments. And uh, Green Filter um, using a memory processor uh, processing can accelerate the filtering operation by uh, 3.7 uh, 3 times um, uh, speed up. Another uh, work related to genome sequence analysis, also uh, near the memory is uh, GenASEM that proposes a new algorithm to uh, do um, genome alignment or sequence alignment and uh, also an efficient accelerator that uh, uh, take at, takes advantage of uh, the new uh, approach. But there are no, not also workloads, interesting workloads in the bioinformatics field or genomics field. Uh, in, in the consumer devices, this is uh, one word that we uh, have mentioned as well in the previous lecture, how uh, Google uh, consumer applications can uh, benefit from uh, processing in memory systems. Also how to accelerate climate modeling using processing in memory system, the neuro accelerator that proposes a, a near high bandwidth memory FEA based accelerator for weather prediction modeling or time series, time series analysis is also extremely memory bound operation that can benefit from uh, processing near memory or processing in memory as we propose in the uh, NATSA with the NATSA accelerator. So these are uh, many, the many different directions that uh, we keep working on and definitely uh, we keep, uh, we, we, we need to um, keep working on uh, to enable the adoption of processing in memory in real systems. Um, as I said uh, in the beginning, um, uh, these um, uh, challenges and, and, and all these uh, open uh, research questions about how to enable processing in memory can be found in our book chapter, A Modern Primer on Processing in Memory, 
Uh, this is um, here you can uh, find a link to the version uh, from 2021, but we are preparing a new version that we uh, will release soon with uh, some uh, interesting updates. Uh, some of them have been uh, presented in this course, but uh, they will all be uh, summarized in a nice manner in the uh, book chapter. Here you have the uh, table of contents in the beginning of the introduction of this uh, book chapter. This is the shorter version in micro. This is the other shorter version in the uh, Journal of uh, Research and uh, Development. Uh, so uh, as uh, closing uh, remarks, uh, processing in memory represents an uh, important research challenge, but also an important opportunity uh, for future computing systems to make fundamentally uh, energy efficient computer architectures that are uh, data centric uh, memory centric systems that are also fundamentally um, high performance and uh, in summary uh, computing architectures that are more efficient uh, in terms of performance and in terms of energy because they compute with minimal data movement. There are plenty of resources in our YouTube channel and in uh, our website uh, about processing in memory and uh, data centric and and memory centric computing systems. I can recommend you, for example, this uh, um, uh, talk uh, from Professor Mudlu. This is uh, one of the many ones that you can uh, find in his uh, website with uh, links to the recordings as well as uh, um, access to the, to the uh, slides. And here you can find uh, the link to this uh, particular uh, talk. So this is all for today. I hope that you found the lecture useful as a summary of uh, the whole course and also as um, a discussion session about uh, how to enable the adoption of processing in memory and what are the challenges that are still uh, ahead of us. Uh, we will continue talking about processing in memory in the next semester. We uh, we will continue covering the basic and more important topics from processing in, in memory, but also discovering uh, new work and what are the most recent advances in the research in, uh, about processing in memory systems. Um, so uh, thank you everyone for your attention and I hope that uh, you uh, get rest in the upcoming weeks before the uh, new semester starts. Thank you very much for your attention.